are listening to Mystery Media Group. Yay! Hailing from the swamps of North Florida is filmmaker and skunk ape researcher Stacy Brown Jr. While watching Unsolved Mysteries in the early 90s, Stacy came across a segment on the Florida skunk ape and immediately became fascinated with the thought of a hairy monster running around the woods in his neighborhood. Over the next 31 years, he would dig through the libraries for information, speak with hundreds of eyewitnesses, and even spend countless hours in the swamp in search of the creature. On November 6, 2011, his work would finally pay off. That night, he had his very first sighting of a skunk ape. Months later, his father, Stacy Sr., would capture what is to be considered the best piece of footage of a skunk ape or Bigfoot-type creature on thermal in northern Florida with a floor camera while camping one night with his son. Since then, you may have seen him on Finding Bigfoot, Travel Channel, and Spike TV's $10 million Bigfoot bounty in which he was awarded the $100,000 research grant. In 2019, Stacy released a film documentary, The Best Evidence and Stories, from his years of research titled The Skunk Ape Lives, which is available on YouTube now. First of all, I have to say, Stacy, thank you for fixing my car out in the middle of the <laughs> Skinwalker Ranch country. And second of all, um, the grasshopper that you flicked off of your beard attacked me on my way home. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I right still on. can't find it. So I need you to come get it out of my car. <laughs> Just kidding. I was driving down the road and she starts screaming. I thought we were dead for sure. It was the grasshopper. Right. Got it. <laughs> Scared the crap out of me. So I don't know where it is. I hopefully it jumped out of the car at some point, but I never found it. And I cleaned out my car really good when I got home too. So anywho. Right. We'd like to welcome Stacy Brown Jr. I've known Stacy for a long time. I spent some time at his house with him and his dad and his uncle. His uncle is my brother-in-law. Um, when I first got there, your dad and mom just opened the house up and treated me like we were family. So I really appreciated that. I really enjoyed going there and hanging out. And that was my first first taste of squatching was with your dad when he pulled out those Bigfoot pheromones. Man, that was strong <laughs> stuff. Holy cow. And in my head, I'm thinking, where in the hell did he get this? <laughs> I was just going to ask, where do you get Bigfoot pheromones? Uh, so there's a website, uh, sasquatchpheromone.com or .net, and no they way. sell them. It's an osmic research uh, facility, and they make all kinds of things, but it's just one of the, like I guess, the novelty items that they sell. But actually, funny story, I have some in my car right now, uh, my Uber, but you can't smell them. They are sealed up, but I keep them, I keep them in the Bigfoot Jeep so that I can, uh, you know, stop. If I'm camping, throw them out. Just in case, you know. You never know. You never know when you're going to need Bigfoot pheromones. Well, or scare some people off. Good to know that we can go to the website and buy them. Who knew? Yeah, they're, they're like uh, $40, $40 <laughs> uh, I think, for a jar of like 9 or 10 And they are horrid. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. They're bad. They're bad. They'll make you gag. <laughs> like, well, Michael, I thought your I dad was pulling my leg, around. but... I hang around Michael enough. Yeah. Sorry. Keep going. Yeah, I Mike. smell kind of like a Bigfoot too. <laughs> your dad took us out fishing one time in the, in the boat. You just gotten your little boat painted. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Sure do. We were going out fishing and I was like, I asked him to let me off on the bank so I could go look around. He's like, yeah, but I'm just going to leave. I'm like, why? Cause a Jaguar will get you. I thought he'd get to pull my leg, but I don't think he was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i, I hope he was because like i'm off in that stuff so, you know i hope there's you, no jaguars i am terrified of big cats you have jaguars out there uh there's uh, like sightings here and there but no, the the law says we don't huh. your dad sure made me think there was so i decided <laughs> yeah. to stay in the boat <laughs> yeah he's probably just messing with you he probably was, but he, I felt like I was the prey there the whole time with the giant spiders and snakes and jaguars. And I'm not worried about grizzly bears. It's those other things that I'm worried about. That's the weird part about it, because I, I feel perfectly fine out here, right? Like, as long as I mind my P's and Q's and, uh, you know, pay attention to what the hell I'm doing, I'm completely comfortable. I'll come out here in the swamp, sleep by myself. 
uh, lots of times with no weapons, no, no like protection or anything like that. And you know, I'm fine. Like I can deal with the gators. Y'all have these like bears that are massive and <laughs> gets like that. Like I, I was up in Maine and they're like, Hey, we got to worry for the moose. I was like the moose. And he's like, yeah, dude, the moose. <laughs> And I was like, oh, my God. And then I'm, like, Googling how big the moose get up there. And I was like, no way, dude. And he's like, yeah, they're only going to run straight, though, so you just go step aside. I was like, that that don't sound right. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. But so I guess it's like a, just a, a culture swap, you know? Like, yep. I, would, I would be scared out there by myself. And when I was walking around the desert out there, I was like, it's probably a damn cougar out here <laughs> you know um it's just the skinwalkers out there man i'm not worried about that stuff. <laughs> maybe a few chupacabras <laughs> right like it, it's the it's the grizzly bears the cougars mainly the cougars the, like, cougars the bears what scare me too yeah you know, the bears they're what they are you know uh for the most part you shouldn't have no trouble if you do uh well it is what it is but like the cougars the problem is they're like my little cat who hides under my chair and jumps out and grabs my leg. And I didn't know he was there <laughs> except they're like 250 pounds and you know, they're playing for keeps. So, yeah. So you've so been all over. Whole- oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've been, I've been all over the country, big footing, you know, uh, I think I've been to every state except for like five. Wow. That's impressive. Like big footing and uh almost every single one. So it's uh it's weird. A lot of the places, you know, you'll go to and I just don't see it. And when I say that, I mean like I just don't see the existence of Bigfoot in such a habitat. Right. Like when when I was in Nebraska, if Sasquatch is a real thing, flesh and blood creature, there is no way it could live on this Indian reservation where these people were saying it was. What do you think they were seeing then? Something different? Oh, that, no, no, no. They all believe what they're seeing. Right. It just doesn't It doesn't make sense as in put yourself in that situation. Like when, when I walk into the woods, when I go into a new state, I'm learning what the, the vegetation is, you know, the flora and the fauna. I'm kind of learning what all I can eat in the woods. Uh-huh. And you get to some of these places and it's just barren. Like we can eat deer. Okay, so now you have to chase that deer down. It's a constant calorie battle, right? Right. right. Like you gotta, you gotta think how, how many days could you make it out here? And if you can't think to your, if you can't figure out about eight different food sources, you know, so you don't deplete one. Maybe have you a little bit of variety because you need to eat a lot. Yeah. Right. To, to be able to keep going. And, and you, you can't rely on catching deer as a staple. What if you get hurt? Right. What if you step on a rock? You know what I mean? Like break your ankle or something. It, so that's, but the, the, the problem with it is, is the people are still having the sightings. Yeah. And so that's why I used to think now, when I first got into this, I, of course, uh, first places I went, California, Washington, Oregon, Florida, right? That was in Georgia. So that was really my spots. Uh And then you get into other places and you just, you don't see it. You don't, you don't see how they can survive. Like when I was in Washington, a lot of parts were just cold. So many months, there was not that much like edibles. You know, these bears are hibernating. And why are they hibernating? Because there ain't no food. So you're telling me this this Sasquatch, this primate, is living living like a cold environment, right? It doesn't make no sense. Like, where do we see this around the world? I think we have some snow monkeys or Arctic monkeys or something like that. Maybe that's just a band. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> but uh, you, know, you don't really see it. All the All the primates are living you know, close to the equator where it's warm, where there's tons of stuff to eat to, to cover their calorie intake. There's a reason they live at these levels. And then now you tell them the Sasquatch lives in Washington and sure it makes sense in the Olympic peninsula, but you know, in other spots like further in the state, well, like places like Idaho, it gets yeah. so cold. What can you, what can you eat? 
And how hard would it be? Like, I know Mike spent some time out there in the woods. And how hard would it be for you to survive out there? It is next to impossible to be able to carry on, have children. <laughs> you know what I mean? And like, how cold is it for how long? How, how long is there snow on the ground in these places? In Idaho, Five, year round. <laughs> and, well, Some places, yeah. And to me, it doesn't make sense. Like, it would make sense that they lived in Florida. Yeah. There's there's food source year round. I mean, it's fish. You got tons of reptiles, uh, worms, ants, uh, you know, all kinds of berries and different things like that. True. And then you go to Nebraska, <laughs> where this native culture has had all of these sightings, our own guys even have encounters when they're there. It doesn't make no sense if it's a it's a, if it's a real animal. I'll never believe. Do you think maybe they're do they move around and go from different areas and that's why they're seeing them? Is they're just passing through? Is that a possibility? Uh yeah. At every place, uh, that's the thing about these. Uh, and this is just obviously my opinion, but from what I've seen, after there's a sighting, you got about two weeks because these things that stay in the same area for about two weeks and then they bounce mm. now that that area may be large you know what i mean maybe a few square miles but they could be somewhere in there you know for about two weeks and then they're gonna move and they're just constantly on the move that's why everything we find is something that bigfoot left very rarely do we find bigfoot <laughs> you know very rarely do we see him doing what he he does on his daily routine and that's my problem with these creatures that's 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 the issue and that's the issue i have with believing it and this is from somebody that's seen one like i still have a problem believing that it can be an ape you know and and you got all these uh great people friends of mine i just guys have y'all have y'all thought about going out in the woods and living and sure we can talk about it Sure, we can say it's possible. Maybe we'll go out, go out there and try to do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, well, I don't. Yeah, that's a very good point. And you know, there's what just, did what did the native tribes do? Right? Obviously, there was a bunch of bison back in Nebraska back in the day. So I guess they didn't have no problem. But I, don't, I have no idea. But they, they also did planted the crops and stuff, right? Right. You know, but did they all live up where it was just covered in snow? I mean, yeah, the Eskimos did, but they fished. Yeah. If, if that if that's the case, and it's like. The lake's frozen, so the Sasquatch have to get fish. They got to be here getting the fish. Well, then, all right, we just wait where they got to come to the food source. Instead, we're going to this one hollow that I seen the damn thing 26 years ago. You know, when you look at it also as a community with a common goal, it's absolutely toxic. It's not moving forward. Everybody's always chasing down yesterday. Right. And not looking for what these things are doing today. And it's another thing I don't understand about Washington and California, especially California. They go through these droughts, record droughts, no water. All right, cool. Let's go up to this mountain or this mountain. Let's find out what mountain's got water on it and where it's at. Because where it's at is going to be where these things are at. Because if it's a, if it's a flesh and blood creature, well, then he's going to come to water at some point whether we got a camera in our hands or not. Why haven't we spent this time and, and like done it right? It's just like when these people um, like won't, won't give it a thought that this may be a paranormal thing that we're dealing with Yeah, because none of it makes any sense. Right. I know what I saw. Firmly believe what I saw. Not crazy. Haven't seen one after 2014. Not at all. Mm-hmm. Not seen it once, but if I was crazy, I'd be seeing the damn things all the time. My <laughs> right. success, my right. success rate is like two percent, you know, and that's that's where it's at. But the problem is, we always have water here in Florida. We don't get all that, so it's like, why ain't you guys in California figured this out? Yeah, why haven't y'all got this done? He's going to come to water. Oh my god! So if the salmon are running, he's going to be there. I promise. You know why he's going to be there? Because all the bears are there. You know why the bears are there? Because they know. You think Sasquatch don't know? Right. You get your ass with Salmon Run. That's what that's I what said I, to Mike. I said, that's we're going to to the Salmon Run this fall and do some squatching. That's what I'm saving up for. I'm going to British Columbia on an expedition, and I'm going to just follow the Salmon Run in a remote spot and see, you know, what happens. See, you know, if I, I figure if I can line up 20 people down the river, 
that the salmon are running through, I should be able to get some evidence. Mm -hmm. These creatures got to be in the area, especially if you can isolate, make sure it's like not where there's a ton of rivers right there by each other. You know, I the problem. Another problem is I got to study the damn salmon migration to figure out how that works. Well, we have a salmon migration up here in northern Utah. Happens about the first of every October. So if you ever want to come up. But the, do you have a lot of sightings in the area? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But see, fact, so that would be it. You know what I mean? That would yeah. be the that would be the thing to do. And is, is the foliage like less during that time of year? Uh, not it necessarily. Still it's still pretty thick. I mean, the trees are starting to change, but like they haven't lost right. the leaves or anything yet. So, yeah, it's still gotcha. pretty thick. Yeah. I mean, if you could just and then, you know, obviously another problem is funding. Yeah. Right. Like trying to fund these things. Yeah. Uh, That's always the problem. It's always the problem. You got to have the money to do it. But then yep. if you can, if you can secure funding, like well, there needs to be a Bigfoot expedition. That's like 30 to 60 days. Agreed. In one yep. spot. Why hasn't the community, why hasn't somebody like organized it, done a GoFundMe? Like, Hey, we're the Bigfoot community. You can even come on it if you want to. Yeah. Come on the trip. Bring yourself out here. Pay for your way. Help out. Do whatever you can. If you can't make it, hey, you can donate. The damn Bigfoot community is huge. Yeah. Tens yeah. of thousands of people. You know what I mean? So, like, I know when these films are getting funded for like 200 grand, 100 grand here, you could raise 100 grand. And at least, if, even if you had people coming in and out on a voluntary basis, you could pay to have campground, you know what I mean? You could you could pay to have gear to give everybody to where some evidence could actually come out of it. Let's do it. Let's figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then you then you try then you try I don't to want get to be in charge. To, yeah, me neither. I don't want that headache. I'll just so, be there. Tell us what piqued your curiosity for Bigfoot. What got you started? Uh it it was my dad. Um Unsolved Mysteries uh was on a lot in our house. Me too. Um, there was also the show that had the guy uh, from Star Trek Next Generation. Uh, what was it called? It was called Sightings. And then, you know, occasionally there'd be an alien or Bigfoot on hard copy or something like that. But I really didn't get to, like, in search of uh, before me, you know. So it was more or less like unsolved mysteries and sightings that really uh, got me into it. And then I get the books at the local library, check them out. Like our, our neighbor uh, kid I played with his mama drove the bookmobile, which is, is just full of books. You come and check them out. So we'd go over there and anytime she had a Bigfoot book, she'd come bring it over to the house. You know, so I was always in it since I was a kid. And, uh, I remember I, I was talking on Spike. I was like, yeah, I've been hunting Bigfoot since 2011. And my buddy's like, dude, you lying. He's like, you've been hunting Bigfoot since you was like six, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Weren't I didn't you pretty... count that as real oh. Bigfooting. Young when your dad got that video? Uh, it was only 2011, so 27. We would go camping and call it Bigfooting. We put them pheromones out, <laughs> set up a game camera, you know. But it wasn't a lot, and it wasn't like we never thought we was going to find anything. Like, honestly, we found a track one time, and I was like, it's got to be a bear, <laughs> right? It's like, yeah. It has to be a bear. You know what I mean? We could, we were talking ourselves out of it. It didn't even have casting material. You know, we were just hanging out and having fun. Then I got him. I was taking him on a BFRO trip to Georgia, Blue Ridge, for his birthday, and we went on that. And uh, that was pretty fun. And then after that, I started kind of starting a Bigfoot because uh, Finding Bigfoot was on. And I called the lady that I'd seen on the episode. She lived like an hour from me. And so we went over there. My dad was supposed to go, but he had gotten bladder cancer at this point. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he couldn't go. So my bass player went with me. And... We went to her house, and that's when I had my first encounter. And then so I, like, changed everything about my life. I was all of a sudden going to be Jacques Cousteau, uh, Cousteau or some shit, you know? <laughs> like <Yeah. laughs> the, People have been picking on me about Bigfoot for years. Hey, that thing was, like, 10 feet away from me. I'm going to uh, I'm gonna prove this to you guys. Like, There's going to be a bronze statue of me in town. 
Uh, that's still the plan, you know, just so everybody knows. Uh, yeah. We're still banking on it, man. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, I mean, I quit my band and everything. Started going at it, like, all the time. And so he's seen how serious I was about it. Uh, and he's like, hey, I'm going to sell my boat. I'm going to do some remodeling around the house anyways, but I'll use some of the money to, to get a FLIR. And he goes, if they're out there, you know, we need to film them. And we started going. And, uh, you know, then we ended up getting the footage, like, had my first encounter in November, and we had the footage in May. Wow. Tell us about Yeah, I mean, hey, we were going a lot. We were going a lot. So the footage, um, it was like a last second. Dad wanted to go. You know, I was working. Uh, It was a Tuesday. I had the next day off. And, you know, he wanted to go. So he came and picked me up from work, and we rode out to Torreya State Park. Uh, now, this spot in Florida isn't like what you think of Florida, you know. Uh, this is like hills, almost mountains like this. They wear you out walking up and down. I don't care where you're from. Like, the grade on them is pretty, pretty steep, right? So, yeah. Uh, but it, it goes up like 240 feet or something like that but um it's up and back down you know so it looks like you're in almost the smoky mountains right florida florida's version of smoky mountains and uh we went out there there wasn't nobody there uh i've been having some success in this area um cliff had posted some knocks on his website or uh, some whoops that he had got from this area uh We had also recorded some howls from that area and stuff. So I was like, hey, well, we're going to go to this spot. And so we hiked down into the down into the campsite there, which is about a mile downhill. Set up camp. Uh, It was grilling, you know, uh, had some music playing and started hearing knocks. And uh, I was like, hey, they're coming in. And he's like, nah, it's just the wind blowing the trees together. And, um, I heard another one and I was like, man, we need to get, you know, get together, get stuff together and go. And he's like, if we hear one more knock, we'll go. And I mean, just as it, those words left his mouth, it was, it was like a grunt with a knock. It was like forceful. You know what I mean? Like it put everything into it. Uh, That makes your hair stand up on the back of your head. I I just, I just looked at it. I was like, bro. (laughs) <laughs> because we were we're still like uh, right there talking already looking at each other and uh, I was like what now and he's like all right let's get shit so we we turned up the radio uh he had a little like headlamp that had a red light on it and so he put that in his hands and it would shine through his fingers in spots right when he needed to see the ground but he switched the thermal to black hot because uh um, you could see the ground better. Like it had rained about probably an inch. I want to say just like a, like a Seattle rain. It was like a drizzle hours. You know what I mean? Never really like monsoon. And so you could see the trail look white. So that's how he was following the trail. And I was holding onto his shoulder and he was walking. And then we hear something coming down the ridge now the whole time like cicadas are, cicadas are super loud They're like deafening you can't hear shit he ain't lying <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, the, them things like, are lying rah, 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 rah. it's like oh my god um but that helped nerdy, us to be honest <laughs> you know what i mean it was it, that was a very important part on us getting to where we got because i think what happened was we were in the middle of them because as we were walking out we're hearing like heavy Sound like something running off over here to our right. Then we'll hear it to the left. Then, you know, hear it in another direction. And then we heard it coming down this ridge. So we made a left there and went down, and it ran right up on us, right? I guess it seen us and hit the brakes because that was another thing. Like, it was so loud when it stopped. Like, oh, you know what I mean? Like, when it hit the ground. The crap out of me. And then so Dad's looking at it. And it's sticking out of one side of the tree. And then it's sticking out the other. And he's like, all right, it's a coon. That's another thing. Like, it was behind this tree, but you could hear it, like, scratching around on the tree. I guess moving its hands across the tree. 
It almost sounded like a coon. I mean, when he said it was a coon, I didn't doubt it. I was like, all right, yeah. And that's, you know, that's how close it sounded was to a coon being on that tree. And, uh, and he's like, oh, hold on, it's two coons. And that's sticking out of both sides of the tree. And then I don't know what happened. And he says he thinks he kicked a palmetto. Uh, you can't hear it in the tape mainly because the cicadas are so loud. Like you can't actually on, on the handy cam footage, uh-huh. you can't hear the things running around, which is very odd. Cause it was very loud, but those cicadas were, like I said, all you hear is the cicadas <sighs> drowning everything out. And, uh, then this thing took off and you just see him turn and look. And then he's like, we got to go. We got to go. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> he's headed back to the camp and the camera goes dead. And he's like, this camera's dead, man. It was looking right at us. It was looking right at us. And I have no idea what we're running from. But he's like, get your gun. Oh, wow. And like, he, he told me to get my gun. Like, I had only heard that a few times. Right. Right. And the other time somebody was on the property. Gee. You know, so. so you knew something was. Uh, I knew, yeah, it was. It was not with nobody him. runs from coons, uh, right? right. <laughs> you know, like if you if you if you knew him, he, he didn't. He's not. Oh, you get your gun, man. You no, know, if he's telling me to get my gun, something's up. So immediately, he's not I'm, scared of anything. Yeah, I I never seen him shook, even when somebody would be like bad situation hurt. Uh-huh. But this situation, he was shook and. So uh, uh, my mind immediate go, immediately goes to a cat, it's a big ass cat, because and, and there's another thing. This is Florida. People release their animals into the wild all the time, and that's all kinds of animals. It's not just pythons. It's tigers. It's lions. It's iguanas. Everything and everything lives and does just fine. Now, usually, like with the big cats, they'll catch them. Somebody see it and they'll catch it. And that's usually how that goes down. But it happened. And it's not outside of the damn realm of possibilities. I'd actually later on, in like 2014 in Mayaka, uh, three Bengal tigers had escaped the Ringling place right there. Because uh, Ringling has like their farm there where they at the time would kept their animals. They still had tigers. And them cats got out. And we were in the woods about a mile and a half from that place when we got the phone call. <laughs> and I was like, it's just like you just cut my throat or something and all the blood went out of my body. <laughs> I was just like, oh no, and I got a nine millimeter. Oh. I'm going to go do with a nine millimeter on a 600 pound cat, you know? Oh my heck, that would be freaky. Cut it off. Yeah. yeah, right. And so uh, immediately, that's where my mom went. We get back to camp. He's like, we got the batteries. We can't see it. It was looking at men, and we can't see it. We got to go. We're blind out here. We're blind. We pick up everything out of that camp and head all the way back. Now, mind you, as we're going back, this thing follows us out, or these things. We're still hearing the shit coming up the trail, and like, you'd hear a stick pop like something stepped on it and broke it. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, you know what that was? But me, I still didn't know what the hell it was. He still hadn't told me. He just, it was big, man. It was big. <laughs> it was big. And then I get to watch the video when we're in the truck. And uh, my dad had told me when I had my first encounter, I called him scared. I was like, hey, man, I think we're about to leave. And he goes, you mean to tell me you've been looking for Bigfoot your whole life? You finally found him and you're going to leave? He said, well, if you come home, I'll punch you right in the face. <laughs> I was like. <laughs> All right, so so we stayed. That was the only reason we stayed. Uh, not that I thought he was uh, going to hit me, but it just uh, he made a good point, <laughs> uh, right? Uh, yeah, you know. And then then when I'm watching that footage, I looked up at him. I was like, "Why are we leaving?" <laughs> it's like <laughs> I told you these things are out here. I was like, "Come on, big dog, what are we leaving for now? We need to get back out there and look for him." And he's like, "All right, smart ass, you take your camera and go down there by yourself." And I was like. <laughs> <laughs> um well, no nah, i'm not mr big brave toaster here i'm uh i'm too scared of these things at the time now like you're the dad I, you need to be out there showing me how to be brave <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> had, had it been now i would definitely have went back down there you know but at the time i wasn't gonna do it and that was that was that man we um uh, we talked about it uh kind of 
And then after about two weeks, we really had a conversation about it, uh, what we should do with it and all that stuff. So uh, we, we And you're talking it, about the video, right? Yeah, the video, because like my dad went into this um, same stuff that everybody does. Like, okay, so you're a sane person, right? And I don't put myself in that category, but like, okay, for sane people, uh, they don't believe in these things. They don't really step much outside of the box on what their reality is, you know, for whatever reason. It's just it's make believe, you know, and they, they they're not fascinated by it. They don't have no interest that draws them. Like to me, it was just for me, it was just so always had an interest. And How I think you not like, be fascinated by these things. Well, that right. So, mind. but okay. So, like, Uncle Frank, <laughs> your brother-in-law, <laughs> uh-huh. he he probably doesn't think about it at all ever. He's like, Unless, man, yeah, ex- exactly, care. exactly. Doesn't don't people don't care, and that's fine. But imagine being that person, and then it steps out in front of you. That's so big. in the in the moment, it shakes you to your core. But then you go through this uh, small town monsters did it when they came out with us because they didn't believe in orbs. And I was telling them, well, I think Bigfoot may be something more than just an ape. I was like, we see these lights all the time. They don't believe in all that stuff. And then they see one. And they happen to have their audio recorder rolling while they see it. So they have a reaction and it's in the film. But in the moment, they're like talking about it. And then like the next morning, they're trying to talk themselves out of it. Oh, well, May, and that's what my dad was doing. So he's like, maybe, maybe Junior had some friend out there to scare me. I was like, Dad, okay, first of all, I don't know nobody that big. Uh, second of all, I don't have no friends. I would run around <laughs> in the woods out here, butt naked at night with no flashlight. I don't yeah. have no friends that good. But if you think I do, then that's a possibility. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, quit trying to talk yourself out of it. But these people, they, they do it because they don't. It, it it was a eh kind of thing before. Don't don't pay it no mind. They may watch it or hear about it if somebody's talking about it, you know, uh-huh. and go about the day and never think about it twice. Like when I was a kid, I'm drawing Bigfoot all the time and shit. Right. <laughs> like I was just yeah. into it, <laughs> you know. Uh, That's pretty much and, all I think about. Right. How many how many times a day do I not talk about a Bigfoot? <laughs> It's what I'm the happiest. <laughs> but yeah, you know, so we we sat there and like, well, we'll send it to five people, see what they say. I sent it to Meldrum, send it to Cliff, send it to Derek Randalls. Anyways, there was five of them and I sent it to them. And Cliff, I mean, they all hit me back and they're like, yo. Because uh, the problem with it when I looked at the footage was that the hands were massive. Yes. It almost looks like baseball gloves or something like that. Really long fingers. Right. And it's just like this you know, with the in th- the thermal image is just kind of this block that you can see is bigger than the rest. And Derek Randall's told me, he goes, dude, I looked at the one that I saw for like 30 seconds face to face and his hands were massive. So the cliff is like, hey, can I do the investigation on a uh, recreation? numbers and all that and you know that's what we were kind of fishing for when we sent it out send it out to respective people and we're going to get there you know oh facebook find bigfoot we sent it to them they were a big deal at the time and uh so cliff said he wanted to do the investigation facebook find bigfoot did their own analysis but cliff didn't have no skin in the game so it was very important that he does his science. And when we mention this word science, I hate this word because it bothers me because like, oh, well, the science isn't there. We need the DNA. Why do we need the DNA? We can't prove it in other ways. Like, okay, we had all the numbers, the gap, the estimated size, and this is all things that you could replicate yourself, right? It was completely redoable experiment was redoable and then you could come up with your own size because we had cgi guys look at it and they're like it's not cgi we have FLIR thermographers look at it this film premiered at the FLIR uh world conference oh really that's yes. cool uh, cliff was cool. given a presentation and that's where it debuted and uh that was in tampa and that was a big deal 
There were yeah. from all over the world there. And we talked to that were coming up, shaking our hands and asking us questions about it and stuff. So we had those people look at it when it come down to it. Like you had the experts saying that is a real animal. And so, okay, now we have the size and it's eight, three. What wow. else is that? If y'all want to talk about, we don't have scientific proof of Sasquatch. We actually do. And that's it. And <laughs> have we not, not left the area, maybe we could have recovered footprint. Uh, that was something I regret. But like the science is there. I mean, you, can, you, you can't get a genetic code on it, but you can't get some funding to do a, a further in-depth search for this thing based on that footage because, yeah. like I said, Cliff had no skin in the game. If that thing Cliff believes is a human, he's going to say it. But at the end of the day, you know, when he came up with his conclusion, it looked better than us, you know, coming up with those numbers because obviously it came from us. And, you know, so if you're hoaxing it, you want to do your own investigation into it. You want to control the investigation. But if you get somebody else on the outside doing it, it has nothing to do with it. It's how it should be done in the first place. But then, you know, everybody just goes about their way. It's like, hold up, man. Like, why can't we get some scientists to look at this and help us figure this out? Okay, hey, so we actually have a creature this big. It cleared this big of a gap. Everything's measurable. Y'all do it. Y'all come up with the same numbers. Okay, now there's like three or four scientists who came up. That's how big the image in this video is. Why can't we get some funding for it? Yeah, we fund all sorts of other stuff. Why not this? We we spent, I want to say $20 million dollars two or three years ago to study the sex habits of pigeons while they're on cocaine. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not kidding though. That's the problem. <laughs> uh, this is not a joke. If you, if you Google this, it will come right up. U S government funds study of the sex habits of pigeons on cocaine, but we can't get $20 million to find Bigfoot. There's yeah. got to be a reason why we can't get that money. But what do they know? You know what I mean? Bigfoot has become, the whole Bigfoot topic's become a uh, sore subject for me. I bet. I bet. You know, you get, in, you get into it and it's just like, damn, man, unless we kill one of these things, you're never going to accept it. And then right. when we kill it, you're probably going to cover it up. That's the part. Probably, the, cynical, yeah. the cynical side of me is like, dude, they already know they're going to cover the shit up. So when Cliff came down to do that investigation, was that when Finding Bigfoot did a show or was it? No. Uh, so once Cliff got his investigation done and us releasing the video to the public hinged on that investigation, if he said he thought that was a person in any way, shape or form, my dad was not putting the footage out. And then Cliff's like, no, hey, listen, man, because the investigation took months. Cliff only came down, I think, once. And I don't even think he contacted us. He just went to the spot. Like, cause I sent him coordinates and like throughout all that time, we're driving out there and getting numbers from, for him and stuff like that. Once it came out, he got his investigation done and it came out. Then he asked my dad if my dad would do it. My dad wasn't interested in doing the show. And then Cliff is like, no, listen, dude, there's going to be no way nobody can rip this. Because he was worried about getting made a mockery of on TV. He's like, no, I know how producers are. I don't want to do this shit. I don't want to be made to look like a damn country bumpkin. That's stupid. <laughs> he said they're probably going uh, to they're probably gonna make it look like we're drunks. And so then when Cliff talked to him, the network called like two days later. But it was like once we put the footage out, it was like the damn phone went quit ringing. Every other phone call, yeah. Every other phone call was somebody wanting to interview us or put us on some TV show. That's crazy. Yeah, uh, I mean, literally, the footage came out uh, on the second of December, and by the end of the day, on the third, Spike TV had called Discovery and Animal Planet. Not to mention all like the, the news affiliates that were calling in, places calling from Kansas City wanting to interview. It is pretty good footage. You know, <laughs> I mean, I can understand why everybody wanted a piece of that. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's what he was like. Damn it, this is what I didn't want because we live in a small town, or did at the time it was even smaller. And of course, everybody knew, you know, because like who was the first people? Well, some of the first people to call was the local newspaper. 
<laughs> you know, uh, like WCTV called and then they had it out and uh, they they came down and did a piece of, on it and it was just like radio stations and everything. It was like, oh my God. How did you guys catch any numbers? crap for that? No. Didn't no. catch no crap at all until I won Bigfoot Bounty and then I caught crap. Huh. Nobody really ripped my dad because he stayed out of the community anyways. And um, they just didn't like me because I was like, I guess I'm eccentric, right? I guess that's a good word for me, you know? And so I will tell people <laughs> exactly what I think. And it doesn't always translate well. <laughs> right yeah. So, uh, right. yeah so people started hate me and then i you know i won that research grant on spike and then it's like i had a fan club of people that hated me it was like three thousand people strong at one point really oh yeah, yeah. I just like, and they're jealous just, because they didn't get what you got <laughs> yep that was exactly i'm jealous it. i am too <laughs> uh, well I, I went and got on a damn uh there was some somebody called me and i didn't check to see who they were i was like sure i'll do the interview it was some huge ass publication like howto.com or something like that and it was like how to bigfoot and, and so i just go on this ramble about how the bigfoot community is garbage and they just need to they're glorified campers and like <laughs> i'm talking all this junk and then it gets posted and then it's everywhere and then like so there was uh there was glorified campers t shirts on sale on the oh internet. Oh my gosh. <laughs> there yeah, I was like, hell yeah, at least some of the people are <laughs> getting down with it. But yeah, no kidding. Yeah, you know, I kinda had a little Trump thing, so I would like argue at the time with these trolls, you know, and just make it worse. And but you know, haters make us famous. It was a goal of mine to have a collective of people that hated me because they keep talking about me. That's true. And then that person can go and make their own judgment on me. And, you know, and it's worked out. Uh, I've benefited from that. So I'm not going to complain. Then, huh? And you don't <laughs> care. <laughs> nope. So tell us yeah. about Outcast Paranormal. So Outcast is a, I guess it's a think tank, right? So we look at all these different paranormal uh, stories and we'll do investigations and the goal behind Outcast is to have everybody so drastically different with their ideas the, just outside of the box thinkers like uh, okay so for like the paranormal world we have these K2 meters and these REM pods and for some reason we're in the mindset that that means it's a ghost I don't know who came up with that means that that's spirits you know, so like we want to do things that are not like that, like nothing against ghost hunting and nothing against Bigfoot and the way people go out and do their things. But it's like we want to try exactly the opposite because the problem is, is if you look at the paranormal world in general. We know the same stuff we did 60 years ago. Yeah, that's true. You know, you know what I, I mean? I keep watching these paranormal shows and I'm like, could we please come up with something different? Can we do and something they don't. new? And it's all the same. Yeah. It's all the same. Now, uh, we'll still try the original methods because, hey, maybe it works. We, we want to be the, the people that turn over every stone. If you come and tell me that you got some device and you can turn it on, and open a gate to the nether realm or whatever. Hey, we're going to come by and check it out. Hell yeah, let's do it. You know what I mean? We'll we'll set it up. What do we need to do this? We'll set it up exactly like that's more or less what it is. So some of our experiments involve uh, various hallucinogenics, um, you know, new tech, uh, stuff people like have built. We have one guy built a thing called the World Gate, uh, a guy named Jay Prather, IDC devices. Um, he makes all this like custom equipment for these shows, and they never like give him credit or anything like that. So he's a friend of mine, and I was like, but I'll let, you can just keep making stuff for us. So he's always like churning out some brand new piece of equipment that's supposed to, you know, run some experiment. That's cool. Um, yeah, and like the one we did at the Conjuring House was a old Nazi experiment that the CIA redid. And so he just like took parts of all three and put them 
all together wow with with his own twist on it to induce an av- astral projection you know uh and then the reason to do it in the conjuring house is to maybe we could learn more about the property maybe right. we could tap into something there because uh anyways that's all right things about that it. nobody has ever tried because we obviously haven't got the answers that we need yet uh, right we, we don't and so, so you that's do need the whole a community thing of people that can think outside the box and think a little bit differently so that's awesome yeah, you know, and you have people who we've gotten gotten our fair share of hate for it already. Like you have these purists, like oh, they're doing occult stuff. Like we did an, an Aleister Crowley ritual, at the end of our first film, to you know hopefully draw a Sasquatch to us. Right, we called on a Greek deity. People, some people can't get with it. They're so stuck in their ways that they just you don't touch the occult. Why don't we touch the occult? Like, because from what it sounds like, they're manifesting stuff over here and they got some real stuff going on. You're telling me not to do it because there's a battle for your soul or some shit. I ain't worried about, I'll worry about that then. Yeah, people Let's, are uh, scared I, of what they don't understand. You know, so like, hey, give it a shot. Like, if you tell me that you can conjure a demon and you know a way to do it, I'm going to tell you to prove it to me and I, and I will come and assist you and we will do it. So that that's the main thing behind that. It's just to try to further the whole collective, like the UFO. I mean, with the UFO field, it's kind of weird because now the government's all basically telling us they're true, which I don't trust. Well, like, why in the hell would the government tell us now? What do they got to gain out of it? What's coming? What are you really doing? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you've told us that we were all crazy for the last 60 years, but now all of a sudden, we're not- oh, no, hey, there are. We got vehicles not made of this world. And so what, why the sudden change? Yeah. You know, and everybody just, oh, okay. The podcast listeners that we have, what would you like them to know about you, about your work? Yeah, yeah. So check out my main thing right now, Outcast Paranormal. That's the that's the passion project. It, it's it's not for everybody. It's uh but if you have an open mind. It ain't boring. I promise you that. So like I said, we make documentary films. Uh, you can check us out on YouTube, uh, outcastparanormal.com. Um, Skunk Ape Experiments, issue one. Uh, it's a trilogy, so don't watch the end and think that, oh, my God, I can't believe it ended it like this. Picks up right where it left off. Uh, that's on Amazon, iTunes, any of those pay-to-play streaming services. And... Uh, yeah, just check me out on social media, my YouTube, uh, Bigfoot Stacy. So we got a bunch of stuff coming. Uh, the, we got that res trip, in Nebraska, that I talked about. That's very cool. We got a film on that uh, coming out. Um, got our stuff we did at the Conjuring House, which I promise you, you're not going to even believe it. Like the stuff that happens is like best case scenario on things you would want to happen. And people are going to be like, oh, this is fake. Well, but it ain't. You always have people that say that. There's nothing you can do to change that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But like, it just is like, I don't know. It was, it was very hard to, when I'm looking at the footage, I'm like, I know that's real. I know that actually just happened. And I know we didn't rig a string to that chair. Uh, right. <laughs> but I was there. I know. And, and things, uh, I got to present this in a way that's, not a bunch of knuckleheads, because that's the thing about Outcast Paranormal. We're a bunch of knuckleheads, <laughs> you know. Those are the best people to hang out with. Yeah, hey, we have a good fun. time. <laughs> we, we have a good time. We can fix your car in the middle of the desert. That's right, you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, we sure appreciate you being on with us and taking time out of your busy schedule, and it's been fun. If you enjoy our show, please like, subscribe, and leave a five star review. For more information, you can visit www.destination-mystery.com. Find your own destination and solve the mystery.